Now, you write that Sternberg's most striking prediction is that the genome is immaterial, implying that standard algorithms do not govern biological processes. So what does it mean for life to be non-algorithmic and also fundamentally governed by cognition? Yeah, and this is, I did an article recently, and I, I did um, an article describing an article that was published by Cy Gart and Perry Marshall and, and Stuart Kaufman. And Stuart Kaufman is, is really just a legend when it comes to the idea of self-organization, and he's thought about the origin of life and evolution. And in this article, they, they, they really make this case in a beautiful way that, that what happens in life is non-algorithmic. Now, what does that mean? Well, let me use a simple analogy. Um, imagine I ask you to take your wife out for dinner, then go to an opera, then go shopping and go to like five different places. And I'm going to ask you, how would you do that as efficiently as possible? Well, what you would do is you would draw, draw a map, you'd connect all the different cities or locations you want to go to. And then you could write a simple computer program to decide what's the shortest path. That's an algorithm. It's like a program to solve some problem. And it's very doable. It, it, it's, it's sort of called the traveling salesman problem. Um, so that's algorithmic. It's a simple program. There's constraints. There's mathematics you can apply. But what if I said, I want you to make your wife as happy as possible next Tuesday? Well, how do you do that? Well, there's countless ways you could go about that. You could think about going to dinner, getting flowers. If you were, let's say, um, a, a psychiatrist, you might give her drugs to make her feel better. So that's non, non algorithmic because it's an open ended problem where there's countless mathematical frameworks you could use to solve it. Well, what happens in life is non algorithmic because if you look at embryology, what happens is you can perturb embryos. You can throw things off course. You can throw chemicals at them they've never seen before. And what the embryo will do is come up with very, very creative solutions to go back on course. So one of the examples that Michael Levin uses in one of his papers is he says, if you look at the kidneys of newt, newts, they have to create these tubes. And what happens is they normally will have different cells that communicate, and then they'll create this tube from you know eight or 10 cells. But now what happens if you duplicate the chromosomes and you make the cell incredibly large? Well, the kidney will, the, somehow the embryo will figure out that it'll use a completely different mechanism. It'll actually fold the one cell into a tube-like structure. So it's using mechanisms it's never used before to create a kidney in a very creative way to solve a problem. And this is the challenge, is what embryos are doing is in facing really open-ended problems where they could address these problems in countless ways, yet it's figuring out how to solve the problem in what Levin argues is the most efficient way possible. So to program, let's say if you, if you imagine a developmental program that can solve these complex open-ended problems would be fantastically difficult. Simple algorithms simply won't do what embryos are doing. Hmm. That is fascinating. And, and as you know, I study technology too. And so it's very interesting uh, to hear that, you know, and I've always considered that, that humans are non-algorithmic mm -hmm. just because it's hard to, it's hard to apply, you know, technique and algorithmic um, details to a human being. You know, there's just too much element of surprise. There's mm -hmm. too many ways of doing things. And so it's interesting that even at the heart of life, you've got that non-algorithmic uh, cognitive um, view of it. It's uh, very interesting. Well, you also wrote an article demonstrating mathematically the challenges of explaining life purely in terms of chemistry and physics. I thought that was pretty fascinating too. Can you summarize that article for us? Uh, sure. And let's talk about the traditional view is that all the information to produce life is in DNA. And that's about three in, in humans. Let's talk about humans. It's about three billion base pairs. And uh, a base pair is in DNA or RNA is really a, a chain of nucleotides. And there's four nucleotides, usually represented by A, C, T, and G. Uh, or in RNA, you might change the T with a U. So you have basically four types of letters for DNA. So that means each letter, each nucleotide corresponds to two bits because two times two is four. There's four possible nucleotides. So that's basically two bits of information. Uh, for each location in DNA, there's 3 billion locations. That's roughly 6 billion base pairs. 
uh, or I mean, 6 billion bits of information. Well, now you have to ask yourself how much information is necessary to control all of development. Well, to, to answer that question, what I did in my article is I said, how many independent regions are there in an embryo? In other words, if you looked at a region of an embryo, where will it be distinct from other regions? It'll have different types of cells, there'd be different types of cell states, different local environments, different tissues, et cetera, et cetera. And a good estimate would be roughly about um, that a single unit in an embryo is like one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter or one millimeter cubed. And that's that can be tens of thousands or even up to 100,000 cells. And that's based on the resolution of an embryo because every single region of an embryo has to have um, a blood vessel capillary giving it sustenance. You need nerves to control different cells. And they're all spaced out more than a millimeter. I mean, I'm sorry, less than a millimeter. And, and, and basically signaling molecules will have a range of, of less than a millimeter very often. So that's a good sense of how large a unit is. So if you break up an embryo into cubic millimeters, that would be on the order of, of 100,000 to a million separate units. And then you ask the question, how many stages are there in, in development? Because you have cells that divide, they change states, the, the, the genes that, that are active are different, the chemical environment's different, the location's different. And you can break an embryology in humans up to about a thousand different steps. And that's, that's a very safe estimate because things are changing much faster than that. Well, and now you start to ask yourself if you've got, a, a, um, let's say you're on the order of a million separate units with a thousand steps, that's like a billion transitions. That's roughly a billion transitions. Okay. If every one of those transitions has to be controlled by DNA, that only leaves you maybe six bits of information for each transition. And if you look at the complexity of transition, you've got cells that are changing their gene states, they're, they're changing location, they're changing shape, they're sending signals. That's not an information at all to control embryology. Now, even if you imagine there's a lot more information in, in the early zygote, it's when the sperm and the egg come together as the zygote, if you assume that all the information is there, then well, how much information can you pack in there? Well, you have maybe 10 to the 15, less than the 10 to the 15 molecules in, in the cell. That would be things like lipids, things like proteins, things like RNA uh, or, or nucleotides. And even if you assume that, that's only about a million bits of information for each transition. Well, if you ask how much information are you gonna need? Well, if you look at models of cells, like whole cell models, well, that's like half a billion bits of information for that program to control the whole cell model. Um, so if you think about the a unit of, of the embryo, a cubic millimeter that has to change shape, size, states, and so forth, it has to deal with these incredibly complex problems, like if it's perturbed, it faces new challenges. Well, you're just not going to be able to fit all the information you need in the zygote. That's the basic argument I made is that you're dealing with these incredibly complex problems. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You get a real sense of uh, just the the sheer amount of information. And there is a limited physical space for that. And that is part of the argument of the immaterial genome. 